You know, MSEC is delighted to have with us tonight Admiral Retired James Stavridis. He served as the 16th Supreme Allied Commander of NATO. And following his distinguished military career, he was the Dean at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University. Today, Admiral Stavridis is an operating executive of the Carlisle Group. He's an accomplished author and contributor for Time Magazine and a chief international security analyst for NBC News. Given his background and his doctoral pursuits in international relations, Admiral Stavridis has considerable experience with the strategic demands of world security, as well as the challenges that military families face as the nation strives to meet the demands on the world stage. And we know those are really tremendous demands. Here to provide some tools, experiences, and thoughts, please give a warm welcome to Admiral James Stavridis. Well done, thank you. Well, good evening, uh, or as uh, General Frazier would say, howdy. Uh, please don't say howdy back, I'd really appreciate that. Um, First and foremost, I do want to thank my very good friend, General Will Frazier, uh, Dr. Mary Keller, for inviting me. It's wonderful to be here. Um, and, you know, after an introduction like that, um, you know, Supreme Allied Commando of NATO, uh, people often say, you know, when they actually see me, <laughs> you know, I thought you'd be taller. <laughs> and then they often say, well, you know, if you're really cool, Stavridis, why were you not a Navy jet pilot like General Frazier was an Air Force bomber jet pilot? And, you know, truth be told, I really wanted to be a Navy fighter pilot, you know, like Goose and Maverick. <laughs> Unfortunately, when I was a, a young boy, a military child, I had a terrible experience at an airport, really traumatic, that made aviation uh, difficult for me. Next slide. <laughs> Next slide. I know you guys can do this. There you go. <laughs> so in reality, I actually, uh, next slide, began life as a military junior, just like all of the young children that inspire uh, the families here tonight. That's my mother and father on the left, Colonel of Marines, George Stavridis, my mother, Shirley. You could see I, I loved those uniforms early on in my life and career. And as you would expect in this world of military families, next slide, I ended up with one of my own. And upper left, myself in my incarnation as an admiral. That's my beautiful wife, Laura, who's here tonight. And to my right, to the left of the photograph, is my daughter, Julia, our uh, NROTC at Georgetown, served as a Navy nurse. She is here with us tonight. And my daughter, Christina, and that photograph on the white, right is taken in 1993 as I am headed out to sea on a cruiser and that's my oldest daughter, Christina, waving daddy goodbye. And I was gone for eight months on that cruise. And like it says, keep calm, I'm a military child. What we discovered was that organizations like this have enormous impact on these military families. So I want to begin by simply saying thank you to this organization. Give yourselves a round of applause tonight. And I also want to say howdy to all of the military and students who are here tonight. And here's an example from my career when I was over at NATO. We got to know the daughter of one of our senior enlisted advisors. And that daughter went on to college here in the United States. She came back from NATO. And uh, she is today herself an educator, a teacher, 
in Jacksonville, Florida. So there is an ongoing strain in this military education that goes generation to generation to generation. And I want to, again, say thank you to this fine organization. So, after dinner speaking is an art, not a science, and uh, we're going to keep this pretty short. But what I'd like to talk about tonight are some of the tools of leadership. Because at the end of the day, what an organization like this imparts on these young men and women as they flow through this educational system is the ability to think, to think for themselves. And I want to very quickly sketch several tools for leaders that I think apply at every stage of life. And I'm going to begin with the number one tool that every leader should have in his or her backpack. And you could think of a number of things that it might be. But I think the most important thing that a good leader has is, we're going to click through a couple pictures here, is right there. It's the ability to listen. Good leaders are listeners. Look at that photograph. This is not Photoshop. This is an actual Belgian air defense system in the 1930s. That officer is listening for incoming aircraft quite innovative for the time. I put it here as metaphor because good leaders are good listeners. They listen to their subordinates. They listen to their peers, a surprisingly rich source of advice. They listen to their seniors. They also listen to people with whom they may have disagreements. They listen with open hearts. That doesn't mean they capitulate in argument, but it does mean that they are willing to listen. I would put that at the absolute top for any leader. What else are leaders? Well, we are in a room full of educators tonight, and I applaud you. So often people say to me, Admiral, thank you for your service. I turn that around to all who are involved in education in this magnificent country, to all the educators in the room, I say thank you for your service to this nation. Please give them a round of applause. The second great tool of any leader is education. This is the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy, where I spent five years as an educator in higher ed. And I'm proud of that. But what I want to impart to you tonight is the importance, and I hope you communicate it to the young students and to your children, which is this. Education at these institutions and at DOD schools around the world and at our own schools here in the United States, education can take a student to a certain point. But ultimately, we all own our education. We own it. And that means that your education only begins, truly, on the day you graduate from an institution. So the second great tool of leaders, after listening, is a simple one. It's reading. It is reading. It is finding your way to books, to magazines, to the great world that exists outside our own personal intellect. It is opening yourself to ideas. Here are some books, nonfiction, I've been reading lately, as well as The Economist. An unbiased source of news, 180 years old, published weekly, disentangled from the day-to-day -day frenzy of 24-7 news. Read some books. Read magazines like The Economist. And by the way, 
read some fiction along the way. Here are some novels that can help illuminate this complicated world we're in. You want to understand what's happening on the U.S.-Mexican border? Check out the novel The Border by Don Winslow about the way that narcotics drive so much of those challenges. You want to understand the maddening, crazed world of Kim Jong-un? Throw away that CIA report. Upper left, read The Orphan Master's Son, which won the National Book Award, a novel about Pyongyang. It's like Charles Dickens goes to North Korea and writes a book about it. It's extraordinary. <laughs> you want to understand the mind of Vladimir Putin? Top center, check out Palace of Treason by Jason Matthews. The point is, read. Good leaders are readers. And it's not just nonfiction of the day and not just contemporary fiction. It's some classics. You want to understand what it is like to live in an oppressive authoritarian world? Check out Margaret Atwood's The Handmaid's Tale. Forget the Netflix series. <laughs> Read the book. You want to understand what it's like to be a woman in 15th century Spanish Empire, read In Yes of My Soul by Isabel Allende. Want to understand what a battle is truly like? Get inside it. Read Gates of Fire by Stephen Pressfield. Point is, leaders are listeners and leaders are readers because they avoid the arrogance of the sense that I know it all. They're open to other ideas. What else do leaders do? So education, reading. Number three on my list is right here. It's innovation. Good leaders are innovators. Stephen Jobs said the difference between followers and leaders is the ability to innovate. And innovation can be as small as a post-it. It can be as big as the moonshot that we celebrate this week. By the way, we have a NASA administrator in our midst, General Chip Bolden. Please give him a round of applause. <laughs> and innovation can be as crazy as the idea of putting airplanes on ships. Who thought of that? Yet today, can we imagine global security without the ability of our president to ask, where are the carriers? What can they do for us? All of that is innovation. And of course, if you look at the screens, this is kind of what we think of when we think of military innovation, right? It's drones and hypersonic missiles and artificial intelligence. Let me give you a different kind of innovation to make the point. When I was commander of US Southern Command, I had a problem. And my problem was that in this world to the south, there is a, a certain suspicion of the US military in Latin America and the Caribbean. Why is that? Well, perhaps because we've invaded many of those countries over the years. They have a long memory. So I was whining about that to my staff. And a brilliant young woman, Sarah Nagelman, said to me, well, you know, Admiral, Instead of sending only the military missions down there, how about if we do some health clinics, sports clinics? Newsflash, they're crazy about baseball in the Caribbean, the north part of South America and Central America. So if you look at that photograph, you see a lot of young boys. You see a handful of young men. These are Army, Navy, and Air Force, Marine Corps, captains and majors and sergeants and corporals who were exceptional baseball players. We found them throughout Southern Command. We went to Major League Baseball, got the uniforms and the bats and the baseballs, went to Transcom, which General Frazier used to lead, and we flew down these military sports clinics. We did parallel ones with young women, track and field, 
That's innovation. It's taking a completely different approach to how you create an impression of our country. And I'll give you one other example of it, and it's from Afghanistan. Flash forward from SOUTHCOM. Now I'm commander of NATO. I'm the supreme allied commander. And again, I have a problem. Now my problem is I've got to train Afghan soldiers. These are Afghan soldiers. I've got to train them to fight a counterinsurgency. To do that, I need them to be able to read. They have to be able to read maps, to read instructions, to read what's written on the rifles that we're issuing them. But none of them could read. Afghanistan in this time was largely illiterate. So look at that photograph. What are they doing? They're reading. They're reading books. Why is that? Because this is a photograph of literacy training. Ambassador Richard Holbrook, when I was done whining to him about my problem, said, Stavridis, why don't you teach them to read? To this room, I say, why don't you educate them? And so we did. We set up NATO literacy training. We brought in non-governmental organizations, and we taught them to read. Six-month program, read at a third grade level, and let me tell you something about Afghanistan. If you are a literary person, if you are literate, you take a pen. You see this pen I'm holding up? You take a pen and you put it in your pocket so others can see it and know that you are literate. When they graduate from this program at the graduation ceremonies, and I've been there, I've done this, we give them a pen. They put it in their pocket. You should see the look on their face. This is the most lasting thing we will do in Afghanistan. It is literacy training. That's innovation. And are there guns in that picture? Hell yeah. We're, <laughs> we're teaching them to fight. They have to fight in order to save their country from the Taliban. And I think they will. There's a lot of discouragement about Afghanistan, but I think we're headed toward a negotiated settlement, and if we achieve it, it will be because we have enabled, educated, trained these Afghans to do what needs to be done. That's innovation. Innovation is hits and misses. You're going to miss a lot more than you're going to hit. You have to put down the roots through your organization, you have to reward the innovators, and that reward can be as small as a post-it on their computer. It can be as big as a life-changing promotion, but you have to reward the innovators. Good leaders do that. And I'll close on innovation with one other example from my time as Southern Command. Frequently, we would catch one of these. Now, you're looking at that, and you're thinking, yeah, it's some high-tech U.S. Navy vessel. Uh-uh. This is a drug runner submarine. It was built in the jungle of Colombia by the cartels. When we caught this particular one, it had three tons of cocaine in it. And when we caught it, I said to my staff in Miami, I want that thing parked right in front of my headquarters. And my staff said, oh, Admiral, great idea. It's like a trophy of war. <laughs> no, <laughs> no. I wanted it there so that every day when thousands of people drove up to that headquarters, they would look at it and say, our opponents are innovators. The cartels are smart. 21st century warfare is brain on brain. And I wanted my team to recognize that our opponents were smart. That's an example we have to follow. So, leaders, they listen, they're educated, and they read, and they're innovators. What else? Fourth, 
Leaders are communicators. And if I asked this audience to imagine communication, most of you would come up with bottom left. Megaphone. Microphone. No. Communication is the big image on that slide. Communication is a bridge. It goes both ways. It is not transmission. And to illustrate it, behold the jellyfish. I love jellyfish. They are, in addition to providing you the brain supplement, Prevagen. <laughs> Did you ever wonder why jellyfish are in Prevagen? The answer is, jellyfish have more neural cells, nerve cells in their bodies by body mass than anything else on the planet Earth. That's how they know where they are in the water. Jellyfish sense the sea in which they swim. That's what communicators do before they pick up the pen. Communicators also do this before they pick up the pen to write the message. They consider alignment in their organization. Good communicators know they can listen and learn from others. Upper left, Stephen Jobs was a master innovator, but he might be the best communicator in the history of business. Read his book before you pick up the pen. Only after you sense the sea you're swimming in. Only after you read and learn from others. Only after you consider alignment. Then you get to pick up the pen. And good leaders know they have to be in this world as well. Now you're looking at that and you're thinking, okay, retired admiral, these are shipping lanes. No. Are these airplane routes? No. Are these fiber optic cables under the ocean? Good guess, no. There are too many. Only 240 cables carry the entire internet. So what is this? This is Facebook. The brighter the white, the higher the concentration of Facebook user. The tell, if you're a poker player, is that China is dark because China holds all of those social networks back because that's data, the new oil. Good leaders operate in this space. They are unafraid of this. And that's the good news. 2.2 billion people on Facebook, a billion people on Instagram. These are the greatest bridges for communication ever built. That's the good news. Here's the bad news. I'm showing you the command and control network of the Islamic State. This is where they are recruiting, proselytizing, and conducting operations. Easter bombings in Sri Lanka, 250 dead. We'd already taken away all of the territory of the Islamic State. That's their territory. We've got to be there to communicate. And you know, sometimes I say that and people say, yeah, Admiral, you're right. It's a war of ideas. Not quite. It's a marketplace of ideas. We have to compete. We should not be so arrogant that we think our values are instantly accepted. They are not. We have to communicate in this world. And what are our values? Democracy, liberty, freedom of speech, freedom of education, gender equality, racial equality. We execute them imperfectly. But they are the right ideas, and we need to move them at scale. And by the way, we need to move them one-on-one. -on -one. This is me in a former life, Supreme Allied Commander of NATO. I'm here with my opposite number, the Supreme Commander of the Russian Armed Forces. General Nikolai Makarov. I always like General Makarov, as you can see. He's a man of normal height. <laughs> <laughs> this was actually a very important meeting. I was, um, we were discussing submarines operating in the Arctic, 
trying to keep them from bumping into each other. And at the end of the meeting, my boss, Secretary of Defense Bob Gates, best boss I ever had, called me up and said, Stavridis, how did the meeting go with General Makarov? I said, sir, it was fabulous. We saw everything eye to eye. <laughs> <laughs> my point, and I do have a point, is that you've got to be in this world. You've got to move and communicate at scale, but personal contact is still vital. Good leaders know both. What else do good leaders do? They collaborate. They build teams, effective teams that care about each other. And I thought about an image for this, and a lot of people told me, yeah, you need like you know eight guys rowing one of those uh, skulls, shells in the Olympics. Now, if you really think about collaboration in the real world where we all live, it's not like eight people doing the exact same thing over and over again. Real teamwork, real collaboration looks like this. It's messy. These young ladies are collaborating, they're drafting, they're moving up, they're moving back. There's a lot of a lot of activity inside that peloton. People fall down. It's messy. But good leaders know that in the messiness of collaboration and teamwork come the greatest ideas. And sometimes it's structured alliances like NATO. Sometimes it's coalitions. This is the coalition against the Islamic State. 77 nations are in this. And sometimes it comes with non-traditional partners. You know, when you think about allies, partners, and friends of the United States, we think of NATO, we think of these partners. How about India? I would argue in this 21st century, an unconventional but vitally important partner for the United States is going to be India. This is the golden temple of Amritsar, sacred to the Sikh faith. In the elections in India last month, 860 million people voted. When President Bush went to India, he said, I bring greetings from the world's oldest democracy to the world's largest democracy. We turn out just over 100 million people in our national elections. India is a massive democracy emerging. And the point is, as we look for allies, partners, and friends, we need to look at some of these less conventional choices alongside our NATO partners. We also need teams like this. Now you're looking at that, you know, that's a uh, US Navy hospital ship. You're thinking, okay, this is gonna be manned up by a lot of Navy doctors and nurses like my son-in-law, Lieutenant Commander Dr. Scott Wallace, or my daughter, Navy nurse Julia Stavridis. No, there are Navy doctors and nurses, but there are also Air Force, Army, Coast Guard, non-governmental organizations, Operation Smile, Project Hope, teamwork, allies, the French, the British, the Dutch, all deploy as part of this. What else can leaders do? Leaders can stay physically fit. That matters. And everything I've talked about tonight, listening better, education and reading, collaboration, innovation, fitness, all of that is undergirded by values. Our values come from the ancient Greeks, they come from the Buddha. On the right, they drop to us through the Enlightenment, they come through our founding fathers. We see them in principled leaders on the world stage like Angela Merkel of Germany. Values matter. And to illustrate values for leaders, let me show you a beautiful picture. Now you're looking at that and you're thinking, okay, what a fabulous shot of a Navy crew. Someone gave this to me as a gift about 15 years ago. They said, Admiral, you're going to love this picture. It's taken in 1949, really proud Navy 
destroyer. And I thought, yeah, it's a great picture. Let me look closely at this. Look closely at that photo. And if you ever served in the military, you'll instantly see something kind of strange about it. Look at the front row. Those are the officers. Look at the second row in that photograph. Those are the chief petty officers. You'll see a gap on the bottom left. You see that blank spot? Three missing chief petty officers. What military genius would set up a formation like this with three missing spots right in the center? So this started to drive me crazy. And I started to look really hard at this photograph. And I thought, where are those three missing chief petty officers? And I finally found them. And they're all the way in the back of this formation. They are three African-American chief petty officers. Photo taken in 1949. Now, I don't know what happened on this day, but I'll give you a highly educated guess. I would guess that the second in command of this destroyer set up the photo. He had all the officers, he had all the chiefs, he had all the sailors. Then the captain came down. We can identify the captain. He's the grumpy looking man in the center of the formation. He's got scrambled eggs on his hat, unpleasant expression on his face. My guess is the captain came down, looked at the formation, saw three African Americans in the second row and said, you three, go to the back of the formation. Stand back there with your division. 1949, African Americans were mess stewards in those days. We've come a long way, but the point I want to make is that as leaders, we should examine things closely, and sometimes something that looks terrific, maybe not so much. And second point is, ask yourself as a leader every day, what am I doing now that in 70 years is going to look oh so wrong? Good question for leaders. Good book about it, David Brooks, The Road to Character. And lastly, as I wrap up tonight, since we're in a, a room full of educators, I want to give you a homework assignment. Here's the good news. You don't actually have to do it. <laughs> Mary Keller is not going to grade it for you. Here's a homework assignment that I recommend to anyone who aspires to be a leader. Ask yourself, who are my heroes? Who do I actually admire? We don't stop and ask ourselves that often enough in my view. So my challenge to you is get out a piece of paper some quiet Friday night and write down five or six people you really admire. They can be national figures, they can be historical figures, they can be fictional, they can be relatives. Here's some people I really admire. That's upper left, Juan Manuel Santos, the president of Colombia, led his nation out of an insurgency. Condi Rice needs no introduction. Upper right, for the sailors in the crowd, Admiral Nimitz, greatest World War II admiral. Bottom left, Simon Bolivar. Bottom right, Michelle Kwan gold medalist. Bottom center is my father, Colonel George Stavridis, U.S. Marine Corps. Write down the names of people you admire. Right next to their names, write down, why do you admire them? Ask yourself that. I admire Nimitz because he led the greatest naval force in history through intense combat. He took command of the Pacific Fleet while it was smoking in front of him on December 9th. And yet he never raised his voice, never lost his temper. I admire that calmness and command. I admire Michelle Kwan for the dedication she showed to her craft of figure skating. And I admire my father not because he was a combat marine, although I admire that. I admire my father because he was a great dad. 
So write down those names, write down why you admire them. Here's the hard part. Go down that list and say, how am I doing? Am I as calm in crisis as Admiral Nimitz? Am I as bold in what I choose to do as Simon Bolivar? Am I as devoted to my craft, whatever it is, as Michelle Kwan? Am I as good a parent as my dad? I'm not. But by asking yourself that question, you will improve as a leader. So two last thoughts. One is, people ask me sometimes as a leader, how fast should you go? And the answer is pretty damn fast. <laughs> so that's a cheetah. That's a cheetah. That's the fastest thing on earth. It can move from zero to 60 miles an hour in two and a half seconds. And look at it, it's optimized for speed, right? It's got a very narrow head that's shaped like an ax that cuts down drag. It's got powerful forelegs, it has big lungs to process all that oxygen. It's got massive back legs to drive it. Whoops, look at the tail. So if you're creating the fastest thing on earth by evolution or creation, take your pick, why would it have a tail like that? Why doesn't it have like a little bunny tail <laughs> or no tail? And the answer is because it's going so fast, so suddenly, that if it didn't have that massive tail, almost the size of its legs, to counterbalance when it turns, it would just go spinning into the undergrowth. So the answer to the question, how fast should you go, is as fast as you can, but a leader keeps an organization in balance. And it's hard. It's hard work. Leaders have to be resilient because that boulder will roll down. Know that. And last thought, as we wrap up a terrific night together, I want to show you this picture and leave you with a quote. The quote is from Napoleon. Napoleon. And, um, you know, I love quoting Napoleon because short people have to stick together at all times. <laughs> <laughs> this is a photograph of Somali migrants. They're standing on a beach in the Red Sea, and they are prosaically lifting up their cell phones. They're trying to get a better cell signal. You know, newsflash, that doesn't work. But they are desperately seeking to connect. Metaphorically, what is happening in this picture? They are reaching for the light. They want to be part of the world. They want to be part of the next step of their journey. This is a picture of hope. And the last thought I have for you, and if you remember nothing else from our evening together, but you want to be a better leader, remember this thought. Napoleon said, a leader is a dealer in hope. A leader is a dealer in hope. Good leaders listen. Good leaders educate and read. Good leaders communicate effectively. Good leaders innovate. Good leaders build teams. Good leaders have values. Those are tactics, folks. At heart, heart, a leader is a dealer in hope. Be that leader. Thank you very much.